Hello, good evening. We're going to be talking uh, another lecture for business ethics here. Um, tonight we're going to be starting our next unit, which is, uh, I've titled it on Canvas as a module of international business. But really, um, the issue that we're going to be discussing, it, there's a lot of issues that come up in international business, but the main issue we're going to be focusing on um, has to do with cultural differences. And um, we're going to have uh, three different authors that we're going to be looking at for this conversation. And they're all going to be bringing a different sort of angle about it. But they're all still going to be connected with the general issue of basically cross-cultural uh, moral disagreement. So these sorts of differences that we have um, and how to adjudicate them. What meaning to make out of that and how should we respond. Um, this is going to be another one of these issues kind of like affirmative action where we can locate the scope of it, uh, the scope of the question with something like just a manager's decisions, like setting policy for how a company is going to be run. Um, but it, in thinking about what choices they should be making here or what should be informing those choices, we're going to get into much bigger issues <laughs> that are much, um, uh, they're relevant to things that don't just have to do with businesses. Um, Globalization is a topic, for example, that has so much going on. It's not just uh, how um, businesses participate with globalization, but also like political stuff and just all sorts of things. And in fact, America is sort of a um, interesting setting for all of this because even in America, we um, have many different cultures present. Right? There is a kind of common culture of American culture that's going on, um, but there's also a lot of differences in there too. We're not all on the same page on everything. Um, so uh, the first thing I kind of wanted to talk about is how um, Velasquez, um, in his paper, is focusing on multinational corporations, multinational enterprises, um, corporations that exist in different countries. Um, but I want to throw just a little wrinkle onto this in terms of framing it up, that it doesn't have to be just a company operating in different countries. It could also have to do with a company that just has to interface with <laughs> a bunch of, my neighbors are looking at me, um, a company that's just interfacing with different cultural communities. Anytime that happens, all the same kinds of principled dilemmas that are that we're going to be talking about in a kind of international or multinational context would also apply. So that's why like America is so interesting here is because even a company in America that's not crossing those boundaries um, into other countries still might have managers of those companies might still have some of these same questions to deal with. Okay, um, so with that little wrinkle in mind, um, let me do a little bit more stage setting. So Velasquez I wanted to start with because he does a good job framing up what's sort of the core dilemma here about international business and connects it with ethical theories. Um, Velasquez is going to have a negative thesis, um, but there is a little kind of positive position he's going to stand for by the end of it, and we'll talk about that. But for the most part, he's going to be helping us understand the dilemma and why it's such a difficult dilemma and not something that's really easy to answer. It's not a straightforward answer. Um, and he's going to be really focusing on matters of ethical disagreement and uncertainty about what is morally right in the face of um, cross-cultural moral disagreement. Warhane's paper is what we're going to also do tonight. Maybe not all of it, but at least some of it. We'll see how much time we have. Um, anything that we don't get through tonight, we'll finish up on Tuesday. Um, but Warhane's going to be focused a little less on the um, like underlying ethical theory issues and a little bit more on the contingencies of just circumstances, what I might call practical issues. Um, and this will be an idea that's relevant for some stuff in Warhane later. But I think it's useful to think about um, this the the difficulties of any moral decision as really being a combination of two things. Like if I'm going to make a, if I'm like say a manager, I'm trying to make a decision and do it ethically, I have to make decide which choice to go with. And what's going to inform that choice is an understanding of the facts and also whatever kind of moral principles 
values, models I've got um, that are going to assign significance to those facts in order to decide what to do. Maybe you remember way, way back at the beginning of the quarter, um, I was talking about the difference between descriptive and normative claims and how there's kind of a logical gap between them. And I use this example of, um, let's say my kid's hitting another kid, which he has been doing recently, I'm trying to work on that. And I tell, I tell him, I'm like, hey, Luke, hitting is wrong. Don't do it. And he's like, why? And I say, well, hitting causes pain. And I remember, maybe if you remember this story, you remember how I told the story was like, there's room for him to be like, I know. That's why I hit them, is to cause them pain. I don't see how that means that it's wrong, right? And the way we fix that, because otherwise, you know, learning that hitting causes pain seems like something that's informative morally, right? But it does so only because we also are taking another principle, another premise of that argument for granted, that causing pain is wrong. That's a normative principle. That's an ethical principle. Causing pain is wrong, not just about the causality of hitting causes pain, right? That there's a factual link between these two phenomena, right? But to learn that, like, I shouldn't hit, that hitting is wrong, could be that, that insight, so to speak, could be, is going to be the product of learning something about how the world works and also learning something about what ultimately matters. And um, Velasquez is more focused on the what really matters part, right? The moral standards we're going to use to measure things. And Warhane, she's going to be involved with that, but she's also looking at just the practical side of the, the factual circumstances and trying to get us to check our expectations about what's going to happen in other countries that are not the, that don't have the same circumstances, they don't have the same history, they don't have the same context as the frame of reference that we are more used to where we live and our history and our culture and that kind of stuff. So it's going to be another criticism but on a really different level than how Velasquez is going to do it. Sorry about that honking. Um, yikes. Yes. <laughs> yes, Walter. Um, I hope that wasn't too bad on the on the headphones for y'all. Um, I totally lost my train of thought, too. Um, shoot. <laughs> um, I think I got mostly to the end of what I was saying about just the contrast here between Werhane. Oh, that's right. Okay, so between Velasquez and Werhane, um, you're going to get kind of a, not a comprehensive picture of this topic because, of course, it's more complicated than this, but you're going to kind of get a sense for the full scale of it, like all the territory that this debate covers. Next week, when we have our next session on this topic, uh, we're going to have a third paper we're going to look at, which is this paper by Arnold. And Arnold is going to try to defend um, human rights as a metric that can be used to adjudicate this cross cultural, cross-contextual moral disagreement. Okay, that's going to be um, Arnold's goal. So you're going to kind of get uh, Velasquez and Werhane saying, like, here's the problem. Here's the kind of stuff we have to worry about. Werhane's going to give a little bit of a positive solution at the end, too. Um, but then Arnold is going to, like, try to meet that standard. right? And he's going to address some of the concerns that um, especially Velasquez is raising. So that's kind of a little overview of where we're going to go with this stuff, um, how we're going to be attacking this. Um, and let me um, pull up my lecture notes here. Uh, again, those in chat, always recommend having my lecture notes on hand as you're following along uh, listening. And for those of you on YouTube, here it is. Here we go. And actually, let's do this so you can still see me. Let's bring the little webcam thing over. All right. So uh, getting into it with Velasquez. How is this going to be, what, what's going to be his approach to understanding and framing up this dilemma of international business? The position he wants to defend is that contemporary moral theory, and by that he means all the big picture moral theories that we have on offer right now. Everything that moral theorists have been providing to us as useful frames of reference for understanding moral questions and how to answer them, he thinks all of those theories that we've got right now fail to meet the needs that globalization has created for multinational managers. Um, what are those needs? The main one is how do you adjudicate cross-cultural moral disagreement? 
with in a, in a way that has some principles so it's not just arbitrary it's not just the manager makes a call about it but we want to know like what's the right way to do this okay so why would this happen why would this become a dilemma um, if you've got the company the multinational enterprise the firm the corporation existing in these different cultural communities um, they're they're not going to be completely separated from each other I mean you might have a branch here and a branch there and those branches on the day-to-day -day business don't talk to each other necessarily or something like that but there are going to be points of connections and the company has to coordinate the efforts from these different like bases these different branches these different uh, sites um, and it, it's going to have some broad policies that are going to apply maybe to the whole business okay there's going to be some points of interaction there's going to be what I've been calling in some of my community leadership work recently mesh points right places where this this entity this community and this community like they are linked up together they're in some kind of cooperative in, um, arrangement and that's where the tensions can start to develop right where people want to do things in different ways um, they want to approach these matters in different ways and you're going to have to make a call about which way we're going to do it um, Velasquez defines globalization as the process by which a company places its operating units in more than one nation and like I said earlier I, I'm not sure that this is um, the best way to frame it because it's just the, the, these kinds of dilemmas are going to show up anytime you have multiple cultural communities that are involved in the operation of the business um, and even when we're just talking about globalization as a phenomenon it's something bigger than the business world um, but I think this definition will work fine for what Velasquez wants to do you can always just throw that little subtlety about it's not necessarily international um, but just anytime you got those different cultural communities and then in terms of globalization being a bigger phenomenon than just companies putting operating units in different places um, that might bring in aspects of globalization that go beyond just bus the business world okay but that is a big way in which globalization has happened um, it's not the only way but it's a it's a major vehicle for that um, what uh, this is what um, Velasquez calls foreign direct investment okay now I'm wanting to interject a kind of distinction here to frame the debate moving forward um, and you can see this in my lecture notes I say as this happens as the company does have its operating units in these different cultural communities there's going to be a problem at a minimal level or there's gonna be a dilemma at a minimal level with how to interface with the ethical and moral standards of these communities and the fact that they're different okay and this one this this uh, side of the distinction is really focusing on just there's a practical problem that's pretty much unavoidable there's gonna to have to be some organized response or setting of policies about what what to be done about this and that is going to be true even if the manager doesn't give two shits about ethics <laughs> and wants to deal with it at all um, think back um, actually a good frame of reference for my distinction it, that I'm presenting here is Hasnas remember when Hasnas was presenting uh, stakeholder theory um, he described how there's the stakeholder theory of management on the one hand and then the stakeholder theory of ethics on the other and the management one was basically just here's a, a guideline or here's some advice about how to be the most effective manager and by most effective we mean generate the most profit right um, and it involves being responsive to the needs of different stakeholders and things like that but it's not necessarily caring about those stakeholders for their own sake or something like that that's what the ethical theory does the ethical theory is not just dealing with the practical problems of how do you deal with these people to fulfill your objectives but the ethical theory is talking about what actually is what you ought to be concerned about what matters here what deserves our responsiveness um, you can be concerned about others just because you're trying to make profit off of them right and that's not what we're talking about there with with uh, stakeholder theory of ethics and it's not what we're really talking about here with international business but it's still it's good to emphasize this because it's not as though um, having to confront this like multiculturalism is something that uh, you can avoid if you don't care about ethics <laughs> you're gonna have to deal with it one way or the other 
But there's a big difference between this, this first side of the distinction that I'm calling interfacing with the ethical and moral standards of communities interacted with versus the second level, um, what I call at a more maximal level, considering the demands of ethical conduct when interacting with these different cultures or inter, uh, getting them interrelated to each other. Uh, having an organized response about those mesh points. So I, I, can, I think I can help with explaining the, the distinction I have in mind here a little bit more in case it's not perfectly clear. This first level as a practical dilemma is really just looking at people's beliefs and values as just things that are true about them. That might be important information for predicting how they're going to behave. So for example, a company that's trying to advertise a product to a foreign culture, foreign to the culture that the company comes from, or that most of its employees come from, where it was founded or birthed or whatever, um, if it's trying to advertise this product to them, it better be aware of what's going on in that culture and whether the messages it's trying to send are the messages that will be received by people who are looking at those advertisements through the lens of their culture. Right? That, that's just like smart PR. So you don't do something really stupid like offend half the population of this culture or community because you're not sensitive to what their values are, right? And you're imposing or or operating on like, well, this would work with consumers in America, so it's going to work over here too. I mean, that that's just boneheaded. Um, if you're caring about profits, right, you, that's going to be a practical concern that you're going to want to be aware of and responsive to. But it's not taking their beliefs or values seriously, right? It's just treating them as properties that are true of these people and nothing more. The second issue, the one that we're really going to be focusing on, considering the demands of ethical conduct here, that's how I worded it in my lecture notes, um, this is really about taking people's moral values seriously. As, as if um, we're trying to figure out what's really right. And we can't just assume that whatever our culture's values are, are the right ones. So what are we supposed to do with cultures that seem to go against the values that we have confidence and conviction are correct? What are you supposed to do with that? Um, and, and also, what is not just a way I can manage people that have different beliefs and values, but is there anything morally significant about that that I need to be sensitive to and responsive to in deciding company policy? Okay. How exactly to... Um, understand cultural difference and its significance, that's the thing we're really into here. So adjudicating cross-cultural moral disagreement is not just a matter of getting a smooth running company going, although it also includes that too. But it's also a bigger concern about like, what does it look like to morally respect people if they have different values about what moral respect is? That's a little trickier of a problem. And that's what Velasquez wants to focus on. And he thinks we should have an answer to it. I mean, all of his negative responses here, I want to be very clear about this. Velasquez is not a fatalist about this problem. He's not saying, look, this problem is so bad because look at all the options on the table. They all suck. He's not encouraging us to give up on this. Um, and, and I'll talk about that more when we get to the end. But while he's challenging things, um, he doesn't believe that it isn't possible to get an acceptable answer about this. He just thinks we don't have the acceptable answer yet. That's really the thesis he wants to be defending. And he's going to be doing a survey of a lot of the sort of major options that we've got in ethics um, and, and trying to show that they all don't work. So, you know, the way I'm, you might have gotten the impression, say, from my discussion of, of the paper project that you're working on right now, the final paper, the research paper, might have gotten the sense that, um, you know, every work of philosophy needs to have some position that it's defending. And, and that's true, that's true. But that position that's defended can sometimes be a negative one. Sometimes the best work that we've, uh, some of my favorite papers and books in philosophy have been philosophers saying, like, here's a problem and I don't have the answer to it. Like, help. <laughs> They're just shining the spotlight on, like, here's an issue. That we need an answer to. Now, just doing that is not really that doesn't take that much work, right? To just like complain about something. But the best papers like this that have this kind of um, negative project or that are like framing up a disagreement or something like that are giving us some insight about how to start attacking it.
right? Like framing it up in a way that gives us some insight about what the question is really asking for, or what would count as a successful answer, or something of that sort of nature. And I think Velasquez does this here in in showing like here are the ways in which the pre-existing options that we have on the table as possible answers to this dilemma fail that ends up setting up a criteria for what could work and even if he's like I don't have that answer right now um, it gives us something to go f with in terms of advancing the conversation further bye good night Luke okay so um, that's my kind of big setup here. Um, and I want to see uh, if you got any questions. Oh, here's a question. Um, Tim, when Velasquez talks about cultural differences, are the differences mostly about the law between nations or beliefs on what ought to be between populations? Definitely not just law. Although oftentimes that'll also be reflected in law. And the reason is, I mean, the same thing like what we do. Um, Ideally, you've got uh, a legal system that's reflecting moral values. If it doesn't, that legal system is illegitimate. So if you've got different cultural communities that have a different sense of what's morally right, then if they're doing their jobs, like if they're being uh, sincere about morality, then of course they want to have their legal system reflect those values. So those are going to be laws that might be in tension with other countries' laws. Um, and that's going to be, you know, potential issue. I mean, one one issue. There's a lot of particular issues in business ethics that people do like case study analysis of. Um, we're I'm trying to focus for our treatment of this issue in our class in this curriculum in a little more general way that's not just restricted to one particular type of issue. We're going to see some examples. Like Werhan's going to talk about some specific examples, but one case in particular it's been talked about a lot. Or two two. Here's two cases. I'll give you two cases that business ethicists have kicked around quite a bit. <clears throat> One is bribery, and the other is child labor. So um, in some places in the world, um, bribery is just the way things get done. It's normal. People expect it. There's whole institutional and social systems built up around it. And if a U.S. company wants to do business in that country, it's like you, either it's going to take forever and it's going to be really inefficient, or you're going to have to grease the wheels with some bribery. And it's not appropriate in America. By American standards of ethical business practice, bribery is wrong. And we have laws that you can be held accountable to for doing that, right? Like, you can get prosecuted for that kind of thing, depending on, on what's the scenario here. A company could get into a lot of trouble about that here in the States, but not in these other countries. Is it ethical for, say, an international multinational manager to tell their employees, yeah, the ones that are working in this other country, yeah, go ahead and bribe them. We'll give you, we'll take some cash out and give you the cash when you go meet to this people. Like, go to that government agency. You know, we need these permits. You know, here's some cash you can give them. Right? It's all planned. Right? <laughs> is that ethical? Right? Is it ethical for the business to operate that way or not? Um, another issue is child labor. So in some places, um, child labor is not illegal. And um, it may even be culturally acceptable and not a problem. And from our point of view, we're like, that's terrible. And if you had a factory in, say, I don't know, Dallas or something that was like hiring kids and, and in the kinds of conditions that people work in those factories, um, that these children work in those factories, I mean, there, there would be huge legal ramifications, right? Um, so if should a company, should U.S. companies not do business this way? Should they not be working with child labor? Now that might seem like a slam dunk. Um, I think when I talk to most people they're like, yeah, child labor wrong. Just hands down wrong. Um, the UN's trying to cut down on it. All, all sorts of international law is trying to target that. When um, the, um, what was it, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, this whole deal, this big economic deal, was being set up part of the goal of it one of the things that was on the negotiating table that was an agenda for the US side of that negotiation was to have stricter standards about child labor so like that it can't be happening 
Um, but there are some pretty interesting... Art There's actually a rational controversy about this, um, that it's inappropriate for us to be applying our standards here, that we're not understanding the full picture here, that there are moral reasons to allow child labor to happen, and that it's not morally impermissible and this absolute wrong. Um, if you're interested in that, check out some papers. I mean, might seem counterintuitive, was to me. Um, I've actually had a couple students write their papers on this over the year, over the years, and um, I still don't think it's right, but there are some, it is a real rational controversy. There's some pretty interesting arguments defending child labor. So those are, those are kind of two examples where, yeah, there might be law involved, but it's also really about the ethical question. Like, what is truly right? And in trying to understand what's truly right, what do we make of the fact that we've got these big cultural differences about what we think is right? I mean, ethics and morality is a major constitutive feature of cultures. I mean, a culture is not entirely defined in terms of that, but is, I would, I would argue, maybe I'd argue, largely defined by that. That's a major, major, major um, component for what makes... Um, a culture have the identity that it does. Okay. okay, is that answering your question, Mitch? Cool. Awesome. Any other questions before we dive into Velasquez's like direct analysis? Looking like a no. Okay, I'm not seeing anything, so I'm going to continue. All right, so getting back to it here. The first, um, the first theoretical offering here is moral relativism. And this was the topic that I promised way back when we talked about moral relativism. That I was like, we're going to get back into this. Don't worry if you still have outstanding questions, especially in how it relates to cross-cultural disagreement. Um, this is this is the topic that we're going to explore this again in. And <clears throat> I, I say in my lecture notes here, um, even though we talked about it before, I, I say nowhere does it put on its best show than in this arena. Um, certainly this is when... Uh, it isn't just a matter of, you know, I'm living my private life with my values, and I'm like, oh, how much should I be, like, interested in or listening to what's going on in cultures that I'm not a part of? I mean, I, I think there there is good reason to do that, but it's a lot easier to say, eh, I'm not going to bother, because it doesn't really impact you. If you're a multinational manager, like I was saying before, there is no way to avoid the problem. And how tricky it can be, like, how difficult it can be, to adjudicate that moral disagreement can be intimidating. And again, Velasquez is not saying that this is impossible to answer. Um, but relativism can look like a really attractive answer where we don't have to make the call of like, okay, whose culture, whose values are we going to go with? Like, which one are you going to pick, right? Um, that might seem like an impossible catch-22 dilemma for a manager. And relativism is kind of like going on here and be like, hey, 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 I got a suggestion. You don't have to worry about that. Because you could just have a policy of kind of, to use an informal phrase for this, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. right? When you're operating in America, use American standards um, and expectations and legal precedent to figure out what is ethical business practice. But when you're in some other cultural community or some other country, then use their values, use their standards, um, go that way with it. Sorry, I'm in your way. You're good. This is your space. I'm invading you. So, <laughs> if you need anything, let me know. Um, sorry, that was my neighbor. Um, I've been appropriating his little workbench out here to put my computer on. Um, okay, so man, I lost my train of thought again. Um, oh, right. The temptation of relativism. So when in Rome, do as the Romans do. This will solve the problem. Um, <clears throat> just whatever context you're operating in, appropriate the standards based on that. And I think kind of what's going on here is that, you know, think about it from the manager's point of view. 
what does it mean for them to attempt to utilize moral relativism as the ethical theory to deal with this dilemma? It's basically saying instead of the manager having to deal with the burden of sorting out what's morally true, they can just defer their judgment to what the culture is saying. Right? The culture of the place that they're operating with um, or interfacing with. Let them decide it. Manager doesn't need to assert themselves. They don't need to assert their own judgments of what's right and wrong and what's good and bad. They can just defer to whatever else is going on in the culture. Okay? That's, that uh, is kind of the way in which relativism ends up working. Um, and, I, and I think that's part of what makes it attractive, is that uh, in some ways it lets the manager off the hook of having to do this difficult discerning work. Okay? Now, we've talked before about how relativism is got some problems with it. And, and also on the societal level, when we're, we're talking about like cultural relativism. And some of those problems we talked about before are going to show up again here in Velasquez's critique of it. But um, as a little bit of foreshadowing here, just remember that cultural relativism and any version of relativism doesn't really provide a standard of accountability for how it's possible to be wrong. That, and that's going to be one of the major concerns here. But let, let's talk. A, uh, let's go into a little bit more detail about what exactly relativism is, because Velasquez is doing some interesting things in his analysis. Um, I think he's right. Very few contemporary philosophers actually treat this as a live option, largely because of the problems we talked about at the beginning of the quarter. But I think he's also right that some of the theories that people offer nowadays, while not being strictly speaking relativists, are getting pretty darn close, if not practically relativists. So the thing that um, Velasquez, I, I think, is using as deciding like which of these other theories are relativistic, you know, sort of like relativism, is in how they practically function. That they're gonna, all of them are gonna involve this kind of deference to cultural values. The the way in which I was describing the manager kind of goes hands off and just be like whatever you guys are saying, that's what we'll do. Okay? Um, <clears throat> Velasquez has a, a definition or sorts of, of for relativism here. He calls it the theory that what is really right or wrong is what the culture says is right or wrong. And that apart from local um, norms that are prevalent in a particular culture, there are no universally valid moral standards. So that's pretty big. That there are not universal moral principles or moral truths, and that there is still a sense in which we can talk about what is truly right and wrong, but it is completely a function of what a culture is saying is right and wrong, what its beliefs are, what its values, what its customs um, are. Okay, So let's talk about what are these positions that are sort of in that ballpark, even though anybody who's defending this, they would be the first people to say, I'm not doing relativism, right? They, want, they, don't, they don't want to do relativism. But it's getting pretty darn close. Um, the denial of universals is really the key thing here. So um, Velasquez talks about particularist theories. And these are kind of difficult to understand. They come in a lot of different flavors. But what they all share in common is that they reject the idea of universal principles. So what every particularist sort of believes or stands for is that... Um, Moral matters are always contingent, all the way down. So think think back to when we did um, Kant, right? Um, way back at the beginning, Kant's first proposition of morality was that um, moral actions are actions done from duty. And all he means by duty is just aligning the will with what's necessarily and unconditionally good. And when we talked about that, I was addressing the possible question of, like, why are we baking into the definition of morality <clears throat> and I, some theoretical definition of what is necessarily um, and unconditionally good. Why isn't, why isn't contingent good good enough, right? Um, and Kant said, this was because if you wanted to say something is good instead of bad, that if that's not going to be an arbitrary distinction, then you're going to have to have a rule or principle that divides... Oh, my camera's shifting on me. I'm trying to... Uh, here. Good, bad. <laughs> I'm trying to get, maybe I can do it here. Okay, come on, camera. Where? Find me. There we go. Okay. Good, 
bad, you're going to need to have something that draws the line between that for that to be intelligible and rationally justifiable. And that rule that defines where that line is drawn actually is universal to all of those things that you've got a contingent judgment about. So even contingent judgments of goodness depend, Kant thinks, rationally on universal standards of goodness, ultimately, right? So maybe this rule deals with this, and we say well, this rule applies only here, not to here, but then there's got to be another rule that adjudicates that, et cetera, et cetera. What particularists are saying is that there's objective moral truth, but it's not universal. It's not dependent on universal rules or principles. Um, we can talk intelligibly about things being objectively right and wrong as like contingency all the way down. Not contingency, uh, and then it finally gets grounded on something universal, or it's like slowly getting to what's universal. There's like contingency all the way down. That's what particularist theories do. A quote from Velasquez here says, Particularist theories are theories that claim that ethical disputes should be settled by appealing to the actual moral traditions and practices of a particular social group. Now this is a more narrow definition of particularist theories. There are other particular theories that don't uh, talk about cultural uh, traditions or cultural conventions, but just want to say that there are unique features of every case that um, that are the, it's the contingencies of particular cases that determine their moral character, but not according to any kind of universal pattern or anything like that. I mean, we you've seen many many times how um, universal theories can be very sensitive to contextual and contingent differences, right? Um, but they're still ultimately happening in a framework of something that's universal, like the principle of utility from utilitarianism. That's if that, man, if you want a universal principle, that's it. Whenever you act, all the time, no matter what, the right thing to do is always the thing that maximizes utility. But as you actually apply that standard into particular cases, it's sensitive to a lot of nuances. Remember, um, Mill wanted a moral theory that would tell us when we need to update our laws because the times and circumstances have changed and what was right in the past may no longer be right. right? So very sensitive to contingencies, but not all the way down. Particularist theories are like all the way down. But in terms of this conversation about cultural disagreement, I think it's fine for Velasquez's definition of particularism here to be restricted to uh, the particular features of societies and cultures. So that, that's fine. And within that more narrow band of particularist theories, you get a few different varieties here. And I want to talk about these um, just a little bit. Uh, maybe people in the chat, you can let me know. My expectation is that um, this section is maybe a little tricky. Um, maybe was a little confusing, didn't read right off the page. Am I right in that? You're, you're my canaries in the coal mine here. Is, is my prediction accurate? Not hearing from anyone. Um, okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to operate under that assumption. Um, and for all of you at YouTube, um, watching this later too. Um, okay, so I, I think that might be true. So I'm going to say some words about this. So first we got communitarians. Communitarians believe that special traditions and culture can override otherwise universal moral obligations. So that's why they're not like purely relativists, right? They think, yeah, there's some universal concerns. But by saying that particular cultures and practices and traditions can override that, that they have greater authority than a universal principle, definitely means we're not talking about the kinds of standard theories that we've seen so far, or realist theories, right? Um, it's making contingent exceptions to universal rules. So those rules are not really universal. They're not unconditional. They are conditional, right? Um, that qualifies the universality of those universal principles or obligations. So it's giving the highest priority here to whatever are these contingent practices that a culture may have. The virtue theory thing definitely needs some conversation. So in my lecture notes, and I've actually been thinking about maybe changing the language on this, but I note, I note that what Velasquez is talking about about virtue theory is not Aristotelian virtue theory at all. But as I say in the lecture notes here, it's weirdo contemporary bastard child. And I make a note to say that I'm not using that language pejoratively. I'm not saying it's bad or something. But just to say that contemporary virtue ethics 
you got some people who are like Aristotelians about it. Um, they're they're one of the one of my colleagues who used to teach at Bellevue College. They he, they actually got a um, he got a better position down in Portland, so he left. <laughs> but he was a he was an Aristotle scholar, and he loved virtue ethics, and he was trying to do it just like Aristotle. Um, but a lot of virtue ethicists today are doing something a little different, and the quickest way for me to describe it, um, which and this is worth doing to understand how it's factoring into this debate, um, as sort of like the moral theory of what would Jesus do? I mean, not necessarily Jesus, right? But it doesn't have to be religious. But the 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 central conceit of modern virtue ethics is that the way you figure out um, what is the right thing to do is to take a role model, someone that you think is an exemplar of virtue, and then mimic your lives on them. So like, what would Jesus do? Je Jesus is a virtuous moral exemplar or something. Um, maybe you think that. And then you're like, okay, I need to be like that. I need to try to develop those characteristics, um, that kind of character, those, those virtues not have, they, they don't have these vices, so I shouldn't have those, um, and even down to individual actions. You can use the, you can use your moral imagination about this person's character and personality to figure out like, well, what would they do? They're more virtuous than me, so I would do, I should do what they do, not what I want to do, right? To kind of correct my character by using this role model as a barometer for right living. That's how a lot of modern virtue ethics works. And because they're appealing to role models as sort of setting the standards here, like kind of calibrating the criteria, they uh, usually end up appealing to intuitions for this. Like, you know good people when you see them. Like, Mother Teresa, pretty obvious, right? Something like that. Or like Jesus or something. I'm using religious examples here, but it could be other things too. Um, Gandhi, right? Um, oh, he's religious too, but um, these people we intuitively recognize as being kind of noble. But here's where the rub happens for this topic, right? Um, and why this is going to get into relativistic sorts of territory. If knowing what's right and wrong depends on a role model, and those role models are sort of set by intuition, well then, it doesn't take long to connect the dots here and reflect that different cultures have different heroes. They have different examples of what they think an ideal human person should look like. So if different cultures have different heroes and heroines, um, they have different models of moral exemplariness, uh, moral excellence, then they're going to also have different moralities, right? They're going to act differently, et cetera, et cetera. So the culture ends up being kind of, it still is a kind of authority about how to live and what to do. Okay? If Aristotle doesn't have this kind of cultural relativism built into his theory because he's using a naturalistic account of how to set what are the virtues versus the vices, right? Remember, he's talking about the function of a thing, what capabilities it has, and to perform, to, to operate in a way that fulfills those objectives in the excellent way, that's virtue. And anything that gets in the way of that, that's vice. Um, anything that hijacks that process. So he, he doesn't have this problem. But this modern kind of version of virtue ethics that still puts the focus on character, but gets the justification derived from role models that we intuitively recognize, that does have the door open to relativism. Uh, chat, let me know. How's this going? Is that explanation making sense? All right, sounds like things are good. Um, okay, and then we've got um, this last category of relativistic-like positions is a little different. Um, Velasquez just calls it partiality. Um, it's not a particular theory here, but there are lots of theories that have some kind of partiality baked into them that, as a component of how they work. But he sort of talks about it as any element of a theory that allows for preferential status um, for the interests of particular communities, um, like family, friends, tribe, any, any kind of like more local, separated type of community identity um, that, that gives them special moral status over and above universal moral obligations. So 
kind of like communitarians that we were talking about before, which are they are not communists. Don't confuse them with that. Um, communitarians are are doing something a little different. But um, this partiality is, I and mean, you might it might rub you the wrong way. I mean, um, certainly I've always have some students who are like, yeah, the whole point is of morality is to not have that. That that's a bias, right? When you privilege yourself over other people, there that kind of selfishness is not moral. That's not ethical. And if I'm doing it through like privileging me and my family over like everyone else in society, that seems like the same sort of problem. Now this is different from how universal moral theories can talk about special obligations, like the responsibility a parent has to their child. Um, I have a responsibility to my child that's different from, say, your child. If you have a child, <clears throat> I don't. I'm not. I don't exist in the same moral relationship. But not because your child is somehow less morally important than my child, right? Uh, even to me, right? Um, that isn't how what, what it should be. Um, but uh, so some of you might have strong moral reactions against that. That's probably because you're not buying moral relativism. You're really thinking about an absolutist sort of moral perspective, which we're going to be talking about next. But some of you might also be like, no, that's, yeah, I feel okay about that partiality thing. And that, that's why this kind of aspect shows up in a lot of moral theories. I, I talk to many people who are like, yeah, I think it's totally fine for me to be more concerned about my family than other people. Um, and again, they might just think that because of the special obligation sort of thing, um, which is different. But I think sometimes it's because they think it's okay and appropriate for them to really, truly, and authentically think that what happens to the people that they are closer to actually matters morally more. So think back to moral worth. Like uh, This is a non-egalitarian type of framework that not everyone has the same moral worth. They're not equally deserving of care and concern. So partiality is in like... <clears throat> If I take this attitude, like, what happens to me, or what happens to my religious community, or my local community, like our town versus the rest of the state or something, or the rest of the country, um, or the people that I've got connections with, like, kind of like a mob boss sort of thing, like the people who are, who are working for me versus the people who aren't, any kind of way in which I'm, I take their needs and interests uh, as being actually a higher moral priority than other people. That's the notion of partiality. And uh, that's going to bring in cultural relativism here too. Okay. I'm, I'm getting to the point where I think we are ready for a break. But let's finish up the relativism thing from Velasquez before we do that. So what are Velasquez's complaints about relativism? Well, there's two basically. Um, one is practical and one is rational. So the first one is, and I, I, I love this argument, Velasquez is basically like, uh, he spends all his time talking about relativism and describing it, and then he's like, and this just really doesn't answer the question. It doesn't have an answer at all. It's basically a non-answer to the dilemma that we posed initially. That if you have to adjudicate cross-cultural moral disagreement, saying just defer to whatever culture is involved doesn't deal with that. I mean, it works okay if you're a tourist or something, right? Like, it, it, it doesn't present any practical problems if you're just a tourist. Like, I go over to this other country, this other cultural community, and I just defer to their standards on everything. And when I go back home, I go back to the standards of my home, this kind of thing. Um, but when you're a multinational manager, you're having to get these things to interface with each other. It, it, there, it's not a separated thing. It's not like you can go switch on, off on off the whole point is how do you get those mesh points to stick together and the relativist basically has no resources to offer to answer that question this this whole policy of when in rome do as the romans is it falls on its face in asking the question how do we put these things together how do we interface these different cultural communities and their different perspectives with each other um, uh, there's a message that popped up. Um, before I leave relativism, could you please compare uh, communitarians and the 100% when in Rome approach? Oh, when do the local rules trump the universal? Uh, so that, that is back to communitarianism. Um, different theories are going to draw the line in different places. Velasquez isn't cashing that out. 
um, he's just saying any of them are going to be doing that kind of thing. So whatever particular communitarian theory is going to maybe set up different circumstances for this, um, but for it to just be communitarian is going. They're going to say at some point that with respect to these things, that overrides it. There's actually kind of um, well, this is going to get into the next objection that Velasquez has to relativism, but there's still, I think their burden of proof is really high here. That when it, when I've looked at different communitarian theories in the past, you know, they might set the line somewhere, but I'm always like, what resources do you have for justifying it, <laughs> right? If it's all contingency, um, it seems like in many cases an arbitrary choice. And that is Velasquez's second objection to relativism that it's substituting arbitrariness for justification. This whole deferring to cultural norms um, just it completely ignores the possibility that a culture could set up inappropriate standards, that it could be wrong. Like say the, Ju the um, Germans, the Nazi Germans, and the Holocaust. That's like those are the wrong cultural standards. But under these kinds of uh, relativistic approaches, we have to say that they're sort of right for them or something, and that if we were dealing with them, we'd have to defer to their values, which is just like, what? Right? So that concern about arbitrariness pops back. It's the same thing that Kant argued that we talked about again, like good and bad. There's got to be a line justifying that. Otherwise, you just have arbitrary double standards. Um, so yes, uh, Mitchell, there's, um, there's not a straightforward answer to your question here about where that line is drawn. Different people put it into different places. But Velasquez's objection here is going to land on all of them. Wherever they draw that line, how are they supposed to justify it if they are not appealing to universal standards? And this is why, um, when I mentioned Velasquez is not ultimately fatalistic about getting an answer for how to adjudicate cross-cultural moral disagreement, he, he's not completely fatalistic. He definitely doesn't think the answer is going to be found anywhere near relativism. I mean, that, that he thinks is dead as a doornail. That's a total dead end. Not, not those, that's not a place to go looking for an answer for this. And the big reason, I mean, this concern about arbitrariness just like slays it. I mean, um, the whole point in critically reasoning about this is to try to hold our judgments accountable. And giving over all the authority to the culture to just decide it means it has no accountability. And that's something that Velasquez is just like, that's unacceptable. That's not going to be an acceptable answer to these problems. Um, okay, so that that's actually, let me see my lecture notes. Uh, yeah, the blind allegiance. I like that language that he uses for it. Blatantly ignores the possibility a culture could fashion wrong standards. Yeah, that's, that's Velasquez. So that's Velasquez on relativism. Um, let's take a break, and when uh, maybe if you chat, if you've got some questions, pop them into the... Um, into the chat conversation space. Um, but when we come back, we'll talk about what Velasquez thinks about the absolutist moral theories, the ones that are kind of more familiar to our crash course in ethical theory, and maybe the possibility of some weird kind of hybrid option between relativism and absolutism um, that's going to try to maybe get the best of both worlds, have our cake and eat it too kind of thing. Um, so that'll be next. All right, we'll take a break. All right, we're back here. So getting into the next movement of Velasquez's paper where he's dealing with absolutist theories all the theories that we've really been discussing uh, whether in the ethical theory crash course or really in the th sorts of particular theories that have been offered on particular issues in business ethics like um, stockholder theory or stakeholder theory or social contract theory or the standard model of whistleblowing or the complicity theory of whistleblowing or all these different things are aimed at providing an ethical answer to a dilemma that is absolutist in its nature. It's trying to identify what are the sort of universal patterns to, um, to ethical action, to moral action. Um, so what sort of distinguishes absolutist theories from their relativistic cousins is their commitment to universal principles. And again, to kind of clarify Velasquez's position here, he is not saying that absolutist theories can't do this in principle. And, and that's where, sort of when you get toward the end of his conversation, what he's sort of recommending going forward, he doesn't have an answer, right? But he thinks, um, his, his criticism is that the current absolutist answers we have are not adequate, that they have problems with them. We'll talk about what those problems are in a second. 
Um, but he's thinking, you know, maybe we could come up with one that wouldn't have those problems. And the major thing that's on his radar is a concern about cultural bias. And bias is something um, tricky. We've talked about bias a couple times before. Um, it's a serious accusation. I mean, to say that some um, position or perspective, much less an entire robust ethical theory, is biased is, is a serious charge that you have to shoulder your burden of proof on. And that's what Velasquez tries to do in his arguments in his paper, to try to show the basis for why we'd be concerned about um, bias with respect to these theories. Um, but again, think back to the core question. How do you adjudicate cross-cultural moral disagreement? And the thing that can't happen is saying, saying something like, well, uh, we should do things our way. Why? Because uh, that's what I think is right. I mean, that's not going to be adequate. And a great way to see that, uh, the, the force of that, is to imagine trying to give an argument to someone who doesn't come from your culture about why you ought to do something a certain way. If you say, uh, like, you appeal, to, if you're talking to people who are part of your own culture, you might do things like appeal to moral intuitions. Just be like, doesn't that seem wrong to you? <laughs> right? Just trying to get them to reflect on their reactions to a particular judgment or to connect the dots by analogy from what we'd say about this to extend it to what we'd say about this. You can make those moves with people who already sort of share the broad cultural values that you have. But when you're talking to someone who doesn't, if you say something like, well, doesn't this feel right to you? They'll be like, no, <laughs> it doesn't, right? I have different convictions. So that appeal wouldn't mediate the disagreement. It, it couldn't be something that could be appealed to to prove this is the answer that universally should be given authority, right? that holds water, that is the most rationally defensible position, all things considered. So the concern here with all the theories that we're going to look at is that they're all subject to Western biases. Now, to just say, hey, these moral theories have similarities with Western culture and what's going on in Western culture is not sufficient to say it's illegitimate, that that's bias. But, and I, and I don't think Velasquez is saying anything like that, but what I think he is saying, or the, the kind of argument he has that does have some real weight to it is that, man, there's some uncanny parallels between that, and there'd have to be something that overcomes that concern, right? It's kind of like where there's smoke, there's fire. It's not always the, the case that when you see smoke, there is fire, but it's a pretty strong indicator of it and something that we'd have to follow up on. And Velasquez is going to say, basically, there's some extra burden of proof here that has to be shouldered to be able to, before these theories would be able to be vindicated as the correct universal answers that en everywhere in all times and places should be using to, to figure out what's the right thing to do. Now, um, some of this conversation, I'm, I'm kind of, jumping the gun on a little bit because this is where Arnold is going to pop up in the conversation when we talk about Arnold on Tuesday. Arnold's going to, uh, well, the first theory that Velasquez considers here in the category of moral absolutism is human rights. That human rights could be this universal moral metric that applies cross-culturally everywhere. Um, and he's going to say there's bias involved with that. And Arnold is going to basically try to make the claim, no, there isn't. Right. Arnold is going to take that concern seriously and try to shoulder the burden of proof to say, no, human rights can serve in this function, that we, can't, we shouldn't have doubts about its universal applicability and its universal validity. <clears throat> that the reason why you would endorse human rights as the right way to look at moral matters is not because of just the convictions and intuitions that you have because you were raised in a certain culture or sort of indoctrinated into that kind of perspective. Okay, so the conversation will get more complicated here. But I like Velasquez sort of just setting it up as like, well, it's pretty clear that can't be the reason. We shouldn't uh, endorse a universal standard just because we like it. And that's the thing he's trying to get us to, to recognize is like how deep the moral disagreement goes and how if you're going to appeal to something, it can't be done in this kind of question begging way. You can't presuppose that you're right against the opponents. You're going to have to take their perspective seriously and give arguments to it. And again, Velasquez isn't saying you can't ever do this, 
I think his hope really is in an absolutist theory is going to be the way to mediate uh, cross-cultural disagreement and trying to figure out under what conditions are we going to go this way with it and under what conditions are we going to go this way with it. It's not going to be like everyone should have you know everyone should be American or no one should be American to like have values that show up in American culture but it's like okay which ones are the ones that are on the level here for what's universally morally right and which ones are not I think Velasquez has that kind of optimism about it but he just thinks you know the, these theories that we have on the table seem riddled with Western bias and they've got a lot of explaining to do if they're going to be able to vindicate themselves against the charge that we just find them convincing or find them compelling if we do because we've got basically Western culture flowing through our veins kind of thing. Okay, that's the concern. All right, Walter has something here. Um, these theories seem to focus out so broadly that it feels like you're left with not knowing where to stop, uh, how much to fight against a potential narrow thinking, as far as where to begin drawing potential ethical connections that may apply universally. Because every culture has their own experiences with heroes and such, and do we have the capacity to be so aware of this unexplored landscape where one's actions, business or not, can really affect so many other things which can circle back and affect farther out than the host country, child labor, economic growth, migration. There's a lot to consider. Um, okay, I've got some questions about some of what you're throwing down here, Walter. Uh, on the one level, that things are complicated because of the like ripple effect of consequences, that, that's kind of nothing new to absolutist theories. So um, anytime you've got, oh, so that is something that you're thinking about, the ripple effect of consequences? Yeah, okay, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting at what you're getting at, good. I don't want to misunderstand what you're saying here. Feel free to correct me if I'm kind of barking up the wrong tree. Um, that's nothing new for absolutist theories. And like we talked about before, when, when I did utilitarianism, when we did Kantian deontology, when we did virtue ethics, I tried to emphasize how, while being absolutist universal theories that are presenting a, a universal metric that's supposed to be applied for ethical decision making no matter the context, it's not that these theories are ham-fisted, one-size-fits-all, reduce everything to a box that doesn't fit for every scenario. It, they're not doing that. In fact, those theorists take it as their a major criteria of the acceptability of their theory that it's capable of being sensitive to the wide variety of uh, morally relevant features that may be contingently different from situation to situation. But to be able to have a moral framework that's able to integrate all those particular judgments in a consistent way that doesn't have double standards um, and has this kind of like theoretical elegance to it. Um, that we're saying the same story and that story has the power to be sensitive to everything. A lot of times when we come up with moral values and principles or, or protocols or policies, especially think about like policies in a business, um, they don't handle everything, right? They've got huge blind spots. They're like, yeah, it might make sense for all these cases to use that rule, but it doesn't, this is not right over here. It's like breaking down. It's not getting at uh, respecting all the moral dimensions of a scenario over here. Um, so I would say, yeah, that's a, that's a natural dilemma that's a part of the territory here with universalist theories. But if anything, I'd say on that front, they've done a pretty good job vindicating themselves. We can still complain about them, right? We can still say, well, I think the way in which this ethical theory is trying to embrace all that moral sensitivity is not appropriate, right? Like, that's why utilitarians and Kantians disagree with each other so much. But that they are able to, in principle, say something about being sensitive to those things is, I think, something that they're doing okay on. Um, or at least they're making a pretty good stab at it. And I think Velasquez is worried about something a little less um, than that. Um, so, like, um, or maybe I should say more. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's not just the complexity of consequences and the complexity of, like, morally relevant features, but that maybe the framework that we're projecting about how to be sensitive to all of those things is presupposing or prejudging some more basic or fundamental frames of reference. And Velasquez is going to target in two areas here. On the level of um, like ultimate values and also on what he calls like metaphysical perspectives. And 
we haven't talked a whole lot about metaphysics, but um, metaphysics is, is really about descriptive ways of looking at the world. How you carve up reality into objects, what are the conceptual categories that you're using to do that, that alert you to what's happening. Um, Warhane's going to talk a lot about this with models. So if you've done the Warhane reading, you probably know what I'm talking about here, that a model is going to actually have a metaphysic, a way of organizing experiences in the world, coupled with a set of values which direct you about how to respond to that world. So they're going to kind of fit together, and that's what a model is. Um, the, but I, I think there might be some more still left for me to address here, Walter, in your comment. Um, I think I might be capturing a lot of it, like when you're saying the fight against the potential narrow thinking. Um, in many ways, it's the... So I, uh, this is a good point to make. Um, so these absolutist theories are, making, are doing this project of trying to figure out what's universally right. Um, and oftentimes, the way that we detect moral blind spots is by recognizing how the, our universal theory it has counterexamples, right? It isn't consistent across all cases. That alerts us to the fact that there's a problem. So, um, I mean, I kind of, maybe I should, I'll, I'll be conservative here and turn my hat on this and say, I, one of the things that recommends an absolutist approach over a relativistic one is the kind of accountability that's involved. So we're, Velasquez was saying before, you know, relativism doesn't have accountability, it has arbitrariness. Um, it doesn't have principles for consistency to avoid double standards, it just says, to hell with that. <laughs> Who cares if it happens or not, right? It doesn't matter. Um, it's fine for there to be these intrinsic uh, con um, contingent inconsistencies. Um, an absolutist model is the model that's going to be disturbed by that. That's going to say, we better make sure we're not having any blind spots. We better make sure that we've got consistent judgments here. Um, so I, I kind of think, while I'm quite familiar with people having an initial kind of reaction of repugnance to the idea of absolutist moral beliefs or perspectives. Um, a lot of times the complaints that they have about them, specifically on this kind of front, and I'm not saying you're complaining about it, Walter. I, I, it's not, what I'm hearing from you is just like, oh, this is a tough problem. Um, you're feeling the difficulty of it, and that's totally fair. Um, but the people who like are uh, critical of absolutist or universal theories really are getting their criticism, their grounds for objecting to it, under an assumption of universalism. They're really on board with that project, even if they don't like some particular universal theory and criticize it on the grounds that it's attempting to do a universal thing. Um, take, for example, uh, something I'm very familiar with. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go on an extended tangent here. I, I think this could be useful. Many times I've had conversations with people that they're like, we're, we're having a debate about ethics or something. And they kind of go into that reaction place of being like, who are you to tell me what I should, how I should live? All right? And they're, they're thinking about values of liberty, autonomy, and self-determination. Right? That other people shouldn't be controlling their lives. That they are a self-determining agent that has rights about how they ought to express their life and make choices and things like that. That's an absolutist universal value. Right? The value on rights, liberty things of that nature, those are universal values. And that's why you're seeing one of the first theories we've got here is something uh, like human rights theory. Um, as our, our first example, Velasquez wants to get, get, get into here about what an, absolute, an absolutist theory could look like. So the right to be self-determining, the right to be able to make choices with regard to my own life, is really not an embracing, uh, if, we, if we think there's some kind of justice involved with that, that's not an embracing of relativism. That's an embracing of an absolutist universal standard. No one should be, this is a universal unconditional thing. No one should be doing this to each other. It'd be wrong for them to do so. But to use that, and, and that, that has a claim to make, like you got Kantian ethics to back that up, right? To back up that kind of moral sentiment. But to use that as the basis for saying like, that's why people shouldn't be doing ethical theory or figuring out what's universally right, is like, whoa, that's totally sawing off the branch you're sitting on, right? If you think that there's a moral concern about that. So maybe that little extended illustration uh, helps with that part. Um, and let me just look through this again. Uh, 
Okay, and then there's maybe one other thing here, Walter. And let me know if, if there's kind of more going on with your comment there that I, I haven't addressed that you're kind of still waiting on an answer or response for. Um, but the other thing that I think is worth pointing out, and I, and I said this before about uh, when we did the ethical crash course about those ethical theories too, that um, they are not ignorant about moral disagreement, the fact of moral disagreement, that not everyone's on the same page about this stuff. Like, that's acknowledged. We know that that's true. Um, the question is, what significance should it have? Um, does that have some kind of moral import? And strictly speaking, for a universalist, it's like, all that means, really, is that people can be wrong. That, like, some people maybe have the right answer, or everyone could be wrong, right? The whatever is objectively morally correct might not be what anyone's thinking, right? We might not have thought of it yet. We might not have even stumbled upon it, or been able to derive or discern what that ultimate good really is, but there's definitely the possibility of being wrong, right? So if you've got a disagreement between two parties or say two cultures around a very particular moral issue that they don't see eye to eye on, one thinks it's right, one thinks it's wrong, something like that, um, well, the, the answer for the absolutist is like, there's at least one wrong party here. They can't both be right. Relativism is the one that says they're all right, but for the absolutist they won't. Um, the the question though, like I framed way back at the beginning of this lecture, is though that we don't want to just it would be wrong for us to dismiss people who have these different perspectives as just wrong on the grounds that they don't believe what we believe, and that's what Velasquez is worried about with bias, that that's the danger here of question begging. We can't just say, oh well, they're wrong. I mean, it's okay. Like Velasquez is going to be okay with, in as much as he thinks an absolutist answer is going to be the way to deal with this problem of international business that we've been talking about, he's going to be okay with saying that people can be wrong. Cultures can make wrong, and he, he this is his reason for rejecting relativism. He thinks it blatantly ignores the possibility that a culture could fashion inappropriate or wrong moral standards. So he's going to be comfortable with that. What he's not comfortable with is us just assuming that other people are wrong because they don't have our values, the values that are represented in our culture. So he's like, you're going to have to take a look at them and see what can be said. Kind of like what I'm encouraging in the paper projects. Like, take your opponent seriously. Use charity to try to be like, why might someone reasonably disagree with what I'm defending in my paper? That's what Velasquez wants us to do. And he thinks the theories on offer have not adequately addressed the concerns of the opponents. Okay. So, um, so yeah, are you, how are you feeling, Walter? I feel like I've, I've kind of touched on the things that you were trying to get at in that comment. Is there anything left over there? Here, while you're typing, I'm going to turn on a light here. Actually, my, uh, my mouth is getting dry. I'm going to go get a drink, too. I'll be right back. Okay. Um, on that other point um, that, Walter, you're bringing up about just moral complexity, like ethical complexity to decision-making, um, this is one of the things that theories are helpful for, to try to um, integrate a lot of concerns and start recognizing patterns in them and principles, providing principles to kind of discriminate about it. Sometimes when we, we don't have as much um, of those kinds of resources available for making sense of things, then it's all like a bunch of data points that are just a big chaos. Right? There's just like a lot of noise in the signal. And what ethical theories are trying to do is like filter out that noise and be like, here's the stuff that's the most important or if this thing matters it's because of this kind of underlying principle like the best example of this um, not necessarily the, the like most correct but <clears throat> the most uh, obvious illustration of how a theory can do this is utilitarianism it's got one principle and that one principle embraces so much moral complexity it's able to get its arms around it right the idea of the reduction to utility means that in the ethical theory, there's a place for all of these other things that we care about. The way that, remember when we were talking about the justification for utilitarianism, Mill's taking great pains to try to show like, oh yeah, justice matters, virtue matters, 
but it matters because of how it promotes utility. And so there's a common metric, there's a way that I can, at least in principle, be able to make determinations of like, how much of this should I sacrifice for this, that kind of stuff, and to deal with all the contingencies. Okay, but let's, let's get back to Velasquez here. So I'm going to pull up the lecture notes again. So our first theory that we're going to um, talk about here is um, human rights. Um, we're going to talk about this a lot more with Arnold. And in fact, uh, in the module, you'll notice that there's a document uh, that lets you take a look at the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Um, I would encourage you and recommend that you read that in as a supplement alongside the Arnold reading. Um, actually, this is a great example I always love to say about how philosophers aren't just people who sit around and talk all day, um, but they actually do things and they make a difference in the world. The UN Declaration of Human Rights was uh, the product uh, in part of a couple philosophers who were commissioned to help craft it, to help give language to it and um, articulate the justification for why things are getting on that list the way that they are. There's, a, there's an underlying theory to why the things on the UN Declaration of Human Rights are there. And that comes from the work of some, some philosophers here. But with whether we're talking about human rights, utilitarianism, or these other theories of justice that don't necessarily involve human rights, um, all of these absolutist theories that Velasquez is analyzing, he's going to make similar complaints about them. That basically, they involve value norms and metaphysical concepts that are eerily similar to a Western worldview. And again, that's, that's not a definitive proof of bias, because just recognizing a pattern doesn't mean that there's something a rational or irrational going on here, something arbitrary. But it's definitely a sign for concern, right? That we really need to do some self-reflection here about the basis on which these things are justified. The same way that if like all of my actions eerily seem to be promoting my own interests above everyone else, then I might be like, maybe I've got a bias for selfishness here, <laughs> right? That, that would, it, it doesn't definitively prove that. It might have just been a bunch of coincidence, but um, that it worked out that way. But it might be a cause for some more serious, critical self-reflection. I think that's, that's really Velasquez's strongest footing here for, for the way that he's setting up his arguments in his paper. But let's break down these two things. So with, first with human rights. What are the metaphysical concepts that separate Western cultures from other cultures? Well, one of these dimensions that sometimes we use to organize differences or recognize contrast between societies uh, are, is this distinction between individualism and collectivism. And Western cultures are, for the most part, individualistic. Now, these aren't absolute categories. They're not completely black and white. There are plenty of... Um, collectivist elements that are a part of Western culture especially in certain sectors like um, I was talking about as an example in my other section earlier today about say um, people that serve in the military um, that environment and the kind of culture that's involved there you really are you're thinking of yourself as part of a group and that you're not thinking about yourself solely as an individual but in general for Western cultures, the individual is the kind of most salient category here. Um, so in the context here of human rights, you see this reflected in how the objects that have rights are individuals. That's how almost all human rights theories go. That the, the obligations that we have that are always the flip side of the coin of rights, we've talked about this before, that if I have a right for something, then everyone else has an obligation to respect it. The obligations that we have on the grounds of rights, human rights, extend to individuals. My right to free speech, my right to freedom of religion, my right to blah, 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 right? And for other people can, by treating me as an individual a certain way, violate those rights, okay? So the individual is the, the object that possesses rights. And in collectivist cultures, an identity is not just a matter of you as an individual. Your identity is set by the way in which you are related to a community. And again, in collectivist cultures, it's not an all-or-nothing thing either, right? <laughs> collectivist cultures still have concern for individual people and their well-being. But a lot of times, the, the, in terms of the priority here, the context is a matter of 
what happens to the individual gets a lot of its relevance because of what's happening with the group. So my identity as an individual is qua my participation with the group. In the individualistic cultures, my identity qua the group is really set primarily through my identity of myself as an individual, apart from others. Okay? Um, this also gets into the value component here of how Western culture is being reflected in human rights. That these human rights reflect a value on liberty for an individual to pursue their own goals, their personal goals, and their personal welfare independently from the community. Like, like phrase, no man is an island in individualism, it's like, yes, you are an island to a certain extent. Not that you don't have relationships with other people, but the thing that is the most important are these values of how I'm able to operate independently, that I have self-determination as an individual. That's a big thing. And that even if it goes against what's going on in the community, that it still is important. It matters. And it cannot be violated. right? Just because it would be useful for the rest of society or something like that um, doesn't mean it's OK to do. I, what happens to me personally is a big deal in individualistic cultures. And that's reflected in, in human rights. Um, and then, um, so in the, in the, in, with respect to this, the contrast here is that the, goal, the goals and welfare of the community take priority over those of the individual. So uh, even if something is not working for me personally, like the way that I fit in with the group and have harmony there, that's a much more important thing. And how I even see my own welfare, like when am I doing good? It's when the community that I'm in is doing good. Right? That, that's the more common thing that happens from my observation in collectivist cultures, is that kind of identification. So there's a contrast here. There's a contrast here. And um, in as much as human rights theory as a proposal for what is the universal, international, intercultural standard um, that could be appealed to for right living, that then we could use for how managers should make decisions about adjudicating cross-cultural disagreement. It's like, well, human rights. We've got to respect human rights. That answers some of the questions. That answer, Velasquez thinks, is not adequate. That it's got, uh, it's prejudging a lot of cultural perspectives that come from Western societies um, and ignores uh, collectivist cultures and the way that they're looking at things. It's not addressing that perspective as a competing perspective here. OK. Um, chat, we doing OK on this? Any that dig up any questions? Things to clarify? All good? OK. All right. So that kind of pattern of how um, Velasquez is dealing with human rights is going to show up again here with utilitarianism and theories of justice. So. With utilitarianism, it's pretty straightforward. Even though utilitarianism might have looked to you to be quite collectivist because you're thinking about the greater good, right? Um, trying to maximize utility for everybody, not just for yourself. Um, and there's that danger of how, well, maybe not danger or virtue, depending on how you're looking at it, um, that utilitarianism is going to end up demanding out of a moral person uh, in many scenarios a kind of willingness to self-sacrifice to take a hit <clears throat> to one's own welfare for the sake of other people. But Velasquez doesn't think that utilitarianism is really an extension of, say, collectivist perspectives, because even in utilitarianism, the overall good is still an aggregate of individual utility. Individuals, not the good of the collective, are the bearers of value. And think, if you want to um, see how sharp this contrast is, Think back, um, this might be helpful, think back to Duska and loyalty. Remember when Duska was talking about the, this third thing in the moderate position, about how there's a, a third thing between people when they're in relationship? Like when we talked about a family, there's like me, my brother, uh, my parents, you know, all, child, all these different things, um, but there's, there's an us, there's a family thing too. And it's not just the sum of its parts. We could all individually be doing fine, and the family could be in ruins. The family relationship is not going well. Like, the community of the family is not going well. And under utilitarianism, 
the group good is really a function of how individual people are feeling and experiencing things and whether their preferences are being satisfied their individual preferences in a collectivist culture it's not looked at that kind of way the priority is on that that community thing that I that object is that thing doing well that's the bearer of value that takes the the priority here so utilitarianism I, I think I think Velasquez's analysis here is is pretty accurate that utilitarianism still has this individualism as a part of it that's how it's thinking about value okay with theories of justice we're gonna be getting into a little different territory and I just want to clarify um, human rights is a matter of justice <laughs> so it's not and I don't think Velasquez is trying to indicate that somehow human rights theory doesn't fall into that category it does but what Velasquez is talking about with notions of justice is really a derivative of John Rawls's theory of social justice which we're going to be studying um, next week yeah we're gonna get into it in our next unit probably on Thursday um, in Rawls's book uh, that he lays out his whole theory in the title of it is actually called justice as fairness so fairness is the real thing that he's focusing on here um, and egalitarianism uh, maybe more technically um, we talked about uh, with that flute example last time on Tuesday about you know the kids all making different claims about why they should be the ones to play with the flute that that's what would be fair to have happen there's a lot of different notions of fairness we could have and that's showing up again here in Velasquez's analysis that individualistic cultures um, and egalitarian cultures have this emphasis on fairness as something that attaches to how individuals are treated um, the, he talks about people receiving in accordance with what they contribute in terms of their effort and resources um, this might sound pretty familiar with all of our discussion of meritocracy in the last unit um, a meritocratic standard is very much an individualistic egalitarian type of moral category um, so fairness in uh, in egalitarian society in especially individualistic egalitarian societies sort of magnifies distinctions between people that you're sort of treated based on what you've got going on which might be different from someone else so that emphasizes the contrast right in a in a meritocracy of like the most qualified person gets the job where like who gets the job sort of identifies what makes these people separate from each other and different from each other whereas in collectivist cultures um, the idea of fairness is that people are receiving equal shares that they're they're treated in a way that ignores those distinctions between them um, in a collectivist culture it doesn't matter who is more useful uh, and who is less useful or who's more skilled or less skilled we're well we're concerned about that but in reference to how the good of the whole is like who are we gonna give this responsibility to for the sake of everybody right not because that person deserves it individually they need to be rewarded or something like that and when that person does maybe the more skilled person is given the responsibility to do this thing on behalf of the group on behalf of the community whatever are the benefits of their activity of their efficiencies then get distributed to everybody so the reason why everyone would want that person to do that job is because the expectation here is we will all be doing better if that happens and not in the sort of Adam Smith invisible hand libertarian type of argument right that's that's not very collectivist um, but in this sense that there's an expectation that we are going to treat the we're going to distribute these benefits in an equal sort of way not on the basis of merit right okay and then this egalitarianism thing um, we talked about egalitarianism before too we did this in the crash course um, and the basic idea of egalitarianism is that everyone universally has the same moral worth people don't have more moral worth than others um, and by moral worth again we mean that if someone has moral worth that means that they are an object deserving of care and concern what happens to them morally matters and under an egalitarian system like say utilitarianism or Kantian ethics they're both egalitarian um, everyone is given this same kind of moral significance and no one's got more than anybody else a Kant is saying you have to treat all people 
as intrinsically valuable, as ends into themselves. Utilitarianism is saying everyone has the basic, the same basic right to happiness. And the only reason you treat people differently is because they're affected differently. They're defected, they're affected by actions in disproportionate amounts. Um, so egalitarianism thinks that um, any kind of discrimination that treats some people as more worthy um, of care and concern is wrong, it is immoral and unjust. And if you come from American culture, that probably sounds very intuitively appropriate, right? It's baked into our constitution. Um, it's baked into the values of our society. We don't live up to it <laughs> in practice. But when Americans are frustrated by that or concerned about that or think that there's social injustice going on be because of that, that's really because we have those values. We see that as something wrong. We're bringing that measuring stick to bear, right? A lot of the criticisms I hear about America today are really actually extensions of principles and values that are like in the Constitution, that are what the founding fathers are thinking about. Um, not all of them, but but that that happens with some frequency. Okay, so where's the contrast here? Um, Western societies definitely have an an intellectual, cultural, and political tradition that moves in the direction of egalitarianism ever since the Enlightenment um, in the early modern period. That was that was a big shift. Um, and it kind of set the course for a lot of, of Western culture. But there are also other cultures that don't have that kind of egalitarian outlook, um, that have really strict hierarchies. Um, and in these cultures, the perspective is that discrimination, in other words, treating people in these absolutely different ways, um, having these um, tiers of their significance and what opportunities and rights and privileges they're going to be given to have asymmetry about those things is perfectly natural and legitimate and maybe for the good of everybody so like caste systems um, work this sort of way you know you've got the lower class and the middle class and then this elitist class on the top um, there are some cultures that are in full-throated support of that kind of thing and saying like that's what's right um, uh, Confucianism has this kind of element to it. And actually, one of the stranger things, as an example here, one of the sort of intellectual great-great-great-great-great-grandfathers of Western society, Plato, actually endorses this kind of thing, too. Plato believes in a caste system as being what a just society would look like. And what Plato talks about and what Confucius talks about are very similar. They talk about values of harmony, that there's no conflict or strife. Um, and to have a hierarchical society is the way to pull that off. So um, these notions of fairness and egalitarianism that define a lot of our thinking about justice in the Western world don't fit with conceptions of justice outside of that in other cultures that are out there. Um, okay, so that's um, those are the absolutist theories that Velasquez takes a look at, and the basic concern here is about bias with respect to them. And he's not thinking that this challenge is impossible to be overcome he, and again he doesn't think he's not tossing out all absolutist options as as not viable but that whatever are going to be viable options here that then we are going to project out universally and internationally and across cultures better be able to have something to say for themselves to justify themselves that's not dependent on moral intuitions that are really culturally idiosyncratic that are parochial. That's the real charge that Velasquez, he's setting the bar, right, for what is going to be an acceptable answer to this question. Okay, I want to check in again with chat before we do the hybrid Frankenstein monster approach. Um, I want to see how chat's doing. Any questions popping up? I'm not seeing anything in the in the thread, but any, any questions you've got about Velasquez's treatment of human rights, utilitarianism, and fairness and egalitarianism. Good. I wish we would have a solution. <laughs> um, 
Well, first we got to understand the problem. So, sorry, tonight is going to be more of the sad part of it or the depressing part of it. Um, but we are going to have some answers. I didn't want to have the curriculum just be like, deal with that. Boom. Uh, so you're going to get some possible answers here. Um, and actually, um, our ethical theory crash course gives some material for these answers too. Um, it doesn't. We there. We have to explore what are the other ways in which these theories could be justified. Um, the ones that aren't the ones that that are coming from these Western intellectual traditions, but um, they're the appeals that Kant makes, that Mill makes, that Aristotle makes, are rational arguments that are not intended to be to get their authority just from people sharing the intuitions. They're they're using a analysis that would be available for anyone to consider regardless of what culture they came from. Whether they are actually effective and adequate is something that still needs to be explored. But if you're looking for possible solutions, there are resources there to make one out of. And as we'll see with Arnold, Arnold's going to try to connect the dots on some of that stuff. And so the fact that we did the ethical crash course will be really good backdrop for understanding the flow of how Arnold's arguments are going to work. Um, but there are possible solutions here too. And if you want to talk with me about what I think about solutions too, I'm going to do that. I'm not going to teach my <laughs> solutions in the class. I mean, that's, I mean, this isn't, you're not taking a class about Tim Linneman philosophy, but I'd be happy to talk about it with people if they're interested. Oh, some people are typing some things. <laughs> I'd like to hear solutions. You'll get you'll get some. Oh, you want to hear my solutions? Oh, I'm not going to do that now. I'm. I, we've got enough other lecture stuff to get through here. Um, but like I said, I'm I, I I'm not I'm not, I'm not uh, interested in being a closed book with students. Or I'm like I'm not going to tell you what I really think. I play my cards close to the vest. I'm really happy to be an open book about this stuff. Uh, I just won't do it in the lecture right now. Okay, there's one final section of Velasquez's analysis that I want to make sure we touch on. And it's, um, many of my students have actually proposed this kind of thing even before getting to the Velasquez uh, paper. Um, and that's just like, can't we have it both ways? Like, they, they maybe people feel some kind of attractiveness to relativism, which it does have attraction to it. We talked about that when we um, discussed it earlier in the quarter, too. But also uh, attractiveness to the absolutist side of things and universal moral standards and things of that nature. So this hybrid approach is proposed, um, the hypernorms theory. And the basic idea is that with certain principles, these hypernorms, those things are absolute and universal. But they don't cover, they don't exhaust all of the moral space. There's space left over for uh, cultures to do whatever they want, to like set the norms for how things ought to operate, um, just as long as they're not violating the hyper norms. Okay. Now, there's a bunch of questions about this. I mean, the main the main goal of an approach like this, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I want to say a few things about this. The main motivation is to try to get the best of both worlds. The way in which we can kind of like grant some authority to cultures, contingent cultures, based on where they're at with their communities. Um, while still recognizing the possibility of cultures doing something wrong, right? To try to capture that intuition, the the thing that Velasquez was mobilizing as the reason for rejecting these relativistic proposals. So it's it's trying to get the best of both worlds. Velasquez's objection is basically, well, when you're trying to get the best of both worlds by doing a hybrid account, you also inherit all of the objections and problems that both of those theories have, and you've got some new ones that show up when you're trying to take these things that otherwise don't go together and try to put them together. They may not fit with each other so nicely. It can't just be like making a casserole with all your favorite ingredients. There has to be some way of understanding where those boundaries are. So there's a question of like, what are the things that are going to be the hyper norms? What is the space that applies to the absolutist stuff versus the stuff that's not absolutist that's sort of relativistic and contingent? Where are you going to draw that line in a way that's not arbitrary? <clears throat> Secondly, um, how are you going to decide about the content of those hypernorms? All of the concerns that Velasquez has about Western cultural bias 
showing up for absolutist theories applies also to the hypernorms. We still need to figure out how are those supposed to be set independently of cultures and their contingency, uh, contingencies. Where is the authority for that absolute, universal, unconditional moral demand of the hypernorms? And then on the side of the relativistic position, he still has got the same concerns he has with relativism. Why should we give this kind of blind authority to, um, to societies to dictate what's right and wrong and what's good and bad, even if we're restricting it to just a limited domain? He's still got that concern there. So um, very, very similar points here. Um, bottom line is that um, uh, it inherits the problems that he's already talked about for both sides. So that's about it. Um, before we close tonight, I want to get a little bit into Werhane. So, um, chat, if you've got any more questions about Velasquez, uh, please drop them down. I'm about to transition here into the Werhane reading, um, and because I want to at least set it up, I want to I want to get at least through understanding what Werhane means by models here, and and giving a an overall uh, picture of what her paper's project is all about. So, chat, anything you want to get in on here before we leave Velasquez behind? Okay, so <clears throat> I alluded at the beginning of the lecture tonight that Werhain is a little more concerned with um, practical issues, with having um, universal standards rather than uh, concerns about their like moral authority, like the way Velasquez has got it set up. So, and she's concerned about capitalism. So she's going to be criticizing capitalism and exporting capitalism to other parts of the world. But we need to be careful about um, identifying exactly where her concerns are. There are concerns with just um, well, okay. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Okay, I was about to go down a track. I don't want. I'm going to start over. Um, the first thing I want to talk about with Werhein is the way in which a theory <clears throat> or a model, an abstract object here, and evaluating that is different than evaluating its implementation or manifestation. So as a little um, foreshadowing for next week, <clears throat> and well actually the week after that, our last week of classes, um, Let's talk communism. A lot of times people are like, communism is stupid, look at the USSR, it was terrible. They killed a bunch of people. Huge repression. No rights. No liberties. Blah, 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 blah. Okay? A totally inefficient economy, etc., etc. To use the USSR as an example of what it means to be a communist is not appropriate. And the reason is like like the way Marx talks about what communism is, his theory for communism as a political system. Um, the USSR was communist, but also totalitarian. And this cuts really strongly against what Marx is up to um, and what he's sort of advocating or proposing. And in fact, anyone who knows their history around the communist revolution knows that there were some pretty bitter intellectual disagreements about what direction this revolution is supposed to go and what it was going to create once it was successful. And there's a lot of different options for how it could look. And just because there's a case here where it happened and things didn't go so well doesn't mean so much for the whole theory. And on the flip side, I see the same thing happening with criticisms of capitalism. They look at the current manifested model of capitalism as sort of the benchmark for evaluating capitalism as a theory, as a model for how society should be run. Um, I think it's pretty hard to argue that our present form of capitalism is perfectly legit and has no problems whatsoever, is absolutely just. That's a really hard sell that only people who are really drinking the ideological Kool-Aid might be comfortable saying. Um, there are definitely things that are problematic about it. But sometimes people want to say everything is fine because what they're really finding compelling is capitalism as a theory. That it's got good arguments, moral arguments, that justify why we should be doing capitalism instead of something else. Okay. <clears throat> 
But that doesn't mean we have to say that it's perfect and that it's doing everything right. So I've seen a lot of people be like, capitalism is bullshit because what's happening now in capitalism is bullshit. And I think that makes the same sort of mistake. Um, there is a real debate here. I don't want, don't get me wrong here. There's a real debate whether the problems and evils of capitalism as it's happening right now are fixable or not. Like the question is, are these problems a direct result of something intrinsic to the essence of capitalism itself? Or is this just a bad implementation of it? Which is really the same debate that happens with communism too. I've heard some people be like, no, what you got with the USSR uh, or in the Cultural Revolution in China is just what it means to be communist. It's baked in, right? It's an essential component. Now, I don't think that that's true in the case of communism. It's a little easier to say that that's not the case. Um, but that is uh, a much more, co it is a serious controversial thing with capitalism. The phrase I've heard so many different commentators and people who debate this stuff use at, on either side of the debate is, um, is so capitalism is like a sick patient is the disease terminal? <laughs> is it fatal? Or can it recover? In other words, is there a just version, a socially just version of capitalism that we should try to be working toward? Is this something that can be saved? Or is it something that we should be giving up on and doing something completely different because it's always going to be unjust? It's intrinsically unjust, something like that. Okay? It's going to yield these problems. <clears throat> Those kinds of criticisms of capitalism is not where Werhein is going. In fact, she's she's not really interested in um, the particular version of capitalism that is currently manifested. Not not really that committed or interested in exploring that. Um, and she and she's more interested in the theoretical version. And she's really charitable toward the moral justifications for it. <clears throat> Think to her discussion of. You know, how do we understand this from a Western context? Like, what role capitalism has played in our history and how we've gotten to where we've gotten and how capitalism evolved out of feudalism. And we, especially people at the time, thought this is, well, once it actually kind of happened, once the capitalist revolution happened, people are like, this is way better. This is a moral improvement. This is moral progress. Feudalism is demeaning. It's dehumanizing. It doesn't allow for liberty. It doesn't allow for personal expression. Um, it's just one step away from slavery, all this kind of stuff. And once you give people private property and a free market with which to use their private property to express their autonomy, now they have all this kind of liberty. They can pursue individualistic conceptions of what is good for their lives. They're not under the thumb of their feudal lord who's like, if you leave this land, we're going to kill you kind of thing. Um, now I do think feudalism is sometimes also demonized and that it also has to be kind of given its own fair shake. I'm not a defender of feudalism, but um, I, 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 history is a, something I really enjoy. <clears throat> and I, I mean, you, you have to study history as a part of studying philosophy. There's no way to avoid that. But there's certain parts of history that don't get as much attention. Like the Enlightenment gets tons of attention and philosophy is a very active time in the history of philosophy in the Western world. Um, and we talk about like the ancient Greeks. Rome was kind of not the best time for f philosophical advancement. A lot of it was just reinventing the Greeks over and over again and copying them. A lot of plagiarism happening in Roman philosophy. Um, and the other sort of period that gets neglected a lot is the Dark Ages. And this is when feudalism ruled Europe. And I've been watching some lectures from a, a Cambridge uh, history prof about the Dark Ages because I don't know that much about it. And I, I think some of his comments here are helpful. Um, he's like, you got to understand the context of people's lives and the way the world works when feudalism was happening. That most people who were serfs under a feudal lord didn't see this as something horribly oppressive. And they didn't see the life of the freedmen as being an improvement. Freedmen were kind of in trouble all the time. Like, they had no security. They had no stability in their lives. Because, again, we're not talking about <clears throat> a place where you've got free markets and private property to express yourself in to be able to get the things that you need to be able to live. Um, a lot of serfs looked at feudalism as basically job security. 
I don't have to worry about my needs. If things go bad, like crops go bad this year, the feudal lord is going to go from the granaries to feed everyone that it that they are a lord over. Why? Because it's a resource investment. <laughs> I mean, it's not... I mean, the feudal lord isn't doing it out of a recognition of the dignity of people's humanity, like Kantian principles or something like that, um, or you, much less utilitarian ones. But it's just like, they don't want to let you die because you're their labor. You're the way that they develop wealth. Um, so they're invested in you for that reason. And that's kind of how the system ends up, ends up working. Also, the lord... Um, provides protection from bandits and aggressors, external aggressors. They keep an army, right? They can protect this this land. So there's a lot of perks under feudalism. Um, but still, we might think, even with all those perks, it's not just. And that capitalism would be something better. And Warhain is, is um, sympathetic with this. So when she's talking about crit criticisms of capitalism in this paper, she's not talking about these like evil inter uh, multinational managers who are looking to go into other countries and exploit them and twirl their evil mustaches um, to just increase profits. She's thinking about the kind of person who says, look, capitalism has brought um, all these moral advantages. It's brought greater dignity, um, to people in their lives, human rights, autonomy, freedom, and liberty, and increased efficiency, which is another argument here on behalf of capitalism over feudalism. Feudalism is not efficient. Um, there's not a lot of liquidity of resources. And the more you can get trade happening, the more resources can go to the people who will be benefited by them and, and also exchange something in retor return for the people who have those resources for them to benefit. So the more things are moving the better everyone else is. This is the notion of market efficiency. Maybe you've had to take some economics classes. Chat, let me know if I'm saying anything that's grossly wrong. I'm not a trained economist, but I have a passing understanding of it. Um, but these are some of the common arguments that you hear on behalf of capitalism. It improves people's lives and well-being too. So if we, through our history, have been acquainted with these blessings that come from capitalism, that we'd want to share them with other people is could be a very sincere motive that it's like look these other countries that are not doing this sort of thing really ought to be doing this sort of thing out of respect for their moral dignity and for their happiness and well-being's sake so for us to bring our multinational corporation over there and start bringing in that kind of system of free enterprise and making that a more robust system in their world is something that they benefit from. This is a socially responsible thing to do, even, potentially. Werhain wants to challenge this. And not on the grounds of the, this, again, the insincerity of these capitalists. They're not, it's not, we're not imagining a target here that is objectionable on the grounds of their exploitative uh, lack of concern for people in these other communities. We're thinking about someone who is believing in the gospel of capitalism so to speak as something that improves people's lives and wants and wants to improve people's lives through that as the means and where most of Werhain's concerns are that when you take this model of capitalism and its benefits like all the arguments and justifications behind it too and put it into other contexts of where these other communities are at it's not always going to produce the results you're hoping it will, sincere capitalist. That's what she says to them, right? This isn't going to work out always the way that you want. And a, a ham-fisted application of capitalism across the planet is a big problem, and we shouldn't be doing that. But um, as a bit of foreshadowing here for where Werhain wants to go, ultimately, she wants to. She, her thesis is going to basically be to try to chart a middle path here. She says it doesn't have to be all or nothing. It doesn't have to be that we completely stay out of other countries' businesses whatsoever. We don't bring any capitalism to whatsoever. Or the option that we basically go in imperialistically and redesign their whole society to make it look like ours. She thinks both of those are not the right answer and that the right answer is going to be somewhere in between. Um, not so much a hybrid approach, but 
she talks about a creative destruction. Um, a sort of new version of capitalism might be built that's not going to look like how it looks to us, um, but it might be better and better for those people. Um, that the, the same kinds of moral objectives could be met, um, but it's, we're going to have to adapt the model. And there might be some components that get dropped in the process. And and I don't think Warhey never says this. I think I get this vibe off of her paper, but I would maybe want to say, if I was going to extend her arguments, she's got she's in a position to, to also say that maybe this would be something good for our version of capitalism too. In other words, trying to adapt capitalism in an ideal way to these other settings and other cultures and circumstances might actually teach us something about what we should be reforming or changing in our own societies too, that we can learn from them just as much as they could learn from us kind of thing. Um, a little bit of that kind of sentiment is where Werhein is going to be going with this. Okay, but um, like I said, I want to get through this part about models before we leave the lecture tonight. So um, that's a kind of broad overview of how Werhein is approaching this discussion, how we're kind of framing up the controversy here. Um, and what her sort of position she's going to be arguing for. She uses a lot of case examples to identify the problem here of why the straightforward application of capitalism is not right, and we should not be doing that. We should not be exporting capitalism into places at, by just projecting out onto them the way that we do stuff. She's got a lot of reasons for why, basically to demonstrate practically how that backfires and how that ends up not doing good, even if the people who are are doing these things are trying to do good, that they actually are sincere, that they're not just being exploitive. Exploitation, like capitalist exploitation, is easy to criticize. It's not that Warhain doesn't think it's bad. It's just there's nothing controversial about it being bad. I mean, it's clearly bad. Um, <laughs> there's no defense of it. Um, okay, uh, but let, let's get to this, this idea. Okay, so when she's talking about capitalism, she's really talking about a kind of worldview a way that we look at things. So I was just talking about feudalism the other uh, a second ago and I was trying to uh, bring in this these comments from this history professor to help you get inside the mindset of people who are living in feudalism and approving of it. They've got their own worldview of like what is making sense to them, um, what their concerns are, what's on the radar, that kind of stuff and then how capitalism changed that. There was a change in perspective and then that led to a change in social organization, institutions, the law, etc. Okay? Uh, and Western society evolved into this very different direction. Um, but what is a model? Um, this is really interesting. So I actually want to get you to some quotes here. So going back to my lecture notes here. Um, do 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 we talked about that. Okay. What are models? Models are mental representations, cognitive frames, or mental pictures of people's experiences. Representations that model the stimuli or data with which people are interacting. And these are frameworks that set up parameters through which experience or a certain set of experiences is organized or filtered. So this, uh, this part of, of, of Werhain's description is really getting at what I'm going to call the descriptive component to models. Um, you might think about this in terms of like a theory of physics, right? A theory of physics presents a bunch of objects, categories, concepts, forces, and then rules and principles that are sort of broad and maybe even universal that organize all those things. And that allows you to take particular pieces of data, like a particular experiment, or observation and plug it into the system to figure out where it sits, right? It organizes this stuff. Models are really robust. I mean, these aren't small picture things. Um, they are big picture things. So, like, we'd love to have a grand unified theory of science. We don't have that yet. Um, we are not able to relate the results of all these different um, scientific branches to each other. But to be able to build a system that could do that, that like organizes all that information and relates it to each other, that's the function of models. Models that are good models do this. Models that are bad models fail at this. Bad models are, like we talked about before, um, a system that lets you deal with a certain range of cases and make sense of them, but then there's these other cases that come along 
that that just doesn't have any resources for, like relativism from Velasquez. They're like just doesn't have anything to say about how cultures interact, like what's right about that interaction space, the mesh points. It just doesn't have anything to say about that. It's a deficient model because it can't handle that. <laughs> it can't make sense of it. Um, so a good model doesn't have those kinds of problems. Um, I say later on in my lecture notes here, like think about models like an employee handbook, except instead of a set of guidelines for how to do your job, it provides the guidelines for how to live. But thinking about this example of an employee handbook, most employee handbooks are bad models. They're not very robust models. They, they tell you what to do. They give you regulations, maybe, about how to handle certain kinds of cases. But inevitably, there are some cases that pop up that don't fit anywhere with what that guideline uh, is telling you or what the, the handbook is telling you. Um, and so that's just a deficiency on its part. So models are aiming always for this kind of like extreme robustness. Um, so this is kind of on the descriptive side of like how to organize experiences and relate them to each other and make sense of them. So having causal principles that help you fit that out. Or say, um, you know, a good example of this would be um, astrology. Uh, maybe some of you know about or have some familiarity with astrology like uh, or the Myers-Briggs tests or things like that that divide people up into certain personality types. And that might be useful for making sense of your experiences. You're like, oh, that person's a Scorpio. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, now I understand what to expect out of them. And maybe I've got some wisdom about how to deal with Scorpios or what's their way of working. Like if I'm the manager and I know my employees' signs and I believe in all this stuff, you know, if it was really true, um, that that might inform how I'm going to approach and understand them. Right, just to make sense of it, to like organize, why did that happen? Oh, oh, it's because of these, you know, these principles help to explain that. That's one function that models have. Integrating our experiences, creating a, a, full, a full comprehensive picture or vision of reality. That's one of their functions. The other function is normative. Um, it gives you guidelines for how to respond to the circumstances that you encounter. This is what ethical theories do. Um, so uh, to take the next quote here from Werhain, she talks about models as mechanisms whereby humans are able to generate descriptions of system purpose, purpose is the normative part here, and form, explanations of system functioning and observed system states, relating it with the descriptive part, and predictions of future system states. So when you take the beliefs and the values and you put them together in this big package you get a model another really good example of this would be religions religions have a metaphysical vision of reality and what's going on and what are the salient categories of things and then they also have an ethical component that tells you how you ought to live and how you ought to be responsive to the world being that way okay so um, not restricted to religion of course it applies for anything and capitalism is another one of these it sees certain things as salient, um, certain types of relationships are on the radar uh, and treated positively or negatively. There are certain concerns that blip and other things are it's the, the model's not tracking. You know, the capitalism isn't paying attention to that stuff. It's going to have uh, different points of emphasis. Um, I, I get really excited talking about this because Werhein, th this concept of models is not unique to working. It shows up all across philosophy. And a lot of my favorite philosophers make a big deal out of it. Um, I mentioned Nelson Goodman in my lecture notes here. He, he has a whole theory of worlds and world making um, to describe these sorts of things. But every time I've seen philosophers bring up this idea, they always come back to these two core functions, making sense of experience and informing how to respond to the world that you have experienced. So they're going to have this kind of like science and like ethics kind of put together. Um, but they could be doing it in very folksy sorts of ways as well. So capitalism is not only a description of how things are, a way of understanding or analyzing things, think about like capitalist economic theory, but also that has this ethical component that justifies, it tells you what ought to happen and also serves as a justification for why things ought to happen that way. So these values on liberty, um, and individual well-being and overall efficiency and happiness concerns, all that kind of stuff. That's all a part of the capitalist model. 
and the expectations for what people are supposed to do and what their role is in participating in this system and all that kind of stuff. That is the model of capitalism. And when we take it and we apply it into other contexts that it was not designed for, that it wasn't adapted to, then we can get into trouble. And that's the kind of other deeper point that Werhain is making here. That these models are are not just um, abstract theoretical um, things that got defined somewhere in a book, but they're things. They are very complex objects, mental objects that we're always updating. Your your model of reality and how to respond to it, how to live your whole life, um, is something that you're con that's constantly in flux. It's always a moving target, and the experiences that you end up having affect how that develops and other people have different experiences and they develop in a different way and the same thing happens for cultures the same thing happens for societies um, based on the kinds of experiences or circumstances or challenges that they have to face then that's going to exert some pressure in where that model is going to evolve to next and different places in this world have different histories and different circumstances and so the way things worked out for us may not work out when you just try to take that model and copy and paste it into a different setting. That's going to be where Warhain's going to go with this. And like I said, this is going to be largely practical stuff um, that, that uh, draws her attention. But I, I think this is good for tonight. Um, I, I feel happy with how far we are. Uh, we can do the rest of Warhain and Arnold on Tuesday. So I'm, I'm thinking good about that. And this is about as far as I got with my other uh, section two, so they'll be on the same page within the two classes. Um, I need to give you a code word. No, oh, what do we got? Um, okay, twist tie. Twist tie is the code word for tonight. Twist tie. Twist tie. Car alarm? No. Oh, yeah, yeah, where's car alarms here? Um, twist tie is the code word. Okay. Um, uh, so I think this is good for tonight. There are about two hours here. I Again, I want to give a shout-out reminder here. Don't put off your paper project. You want to get direction on it soon um, so that you can be kind of not leaving all your brainstorming and developing of your ideas the last minute. This paper is, trust me, this paper is going to be hell if you try to do it last minute. It's going to be very intimidating and difficult and overwhelming. I mean, that maybe not. Maybe you'll get lucky or something. But um, this is not an easy project. And trying to find ways to do this project in an easy way is going to result in a product that's probably not very good and you probably won't be happy with the grade that you get on it. Um, I know that I'm doing something challenging. I'm, I'm um, challenging you to have some ambition here to do a project like this one. Um, that's a part of just philosophy intrinsically. Um, but I'm, I'm asking you to, or I, kind of the way I've set up the instructions for the assignment, I'm, I'm asking you to do original work. And that's a lot harder than doing something like just a response paper or something like that. Tried to warm you up with that, with doing the presentations as like a response paper. Um, but this this uh, this research paper requires you to set up a problem and frame it, give an answer to it, defend it, and anticipate objections and respond to those objections. That's all tough stuff, and you don't have to be all alone in it too. Uh, again, I've said it a million times. I'm really happy to be a broken record about this though. But I'm a source of support for you, and I want you to use me in that way. And so over the weekend here. Call me up. If we've talked already, We, I'd love to talk to you some more. Don't be shy about contacting me just because we've already talked or something um, and cleared a topic or something like that. I can I can probably be of further use to you. Um, and if you haven't talked to me, that's pretty overdue. So we should do, we, that needs to happen ASAP. Um, so let me know how I can help you. If you're really not feeling confident with this assignment, um, if you're feeling a little insecure about your abilities to do it, um, uh, that that is exactly the case that I want to be able to have the chance to have a conversation with you and do what I can to not only encourage you but also to give you some direction or tools where you can be unlocked and empowered to really take a stab at this thing. Um, but one thing I'll also say is that um, if you're feeling insecure about your project, that's actually can be a good sign. 
that's like a, a confirming sign that your paper is something worth doing, that you're you're on target for what the assignment is asking for. If you're feeling like I think I mentioned this before the uh, two Tuesdays ago, um, that if you if you think you got this, your topic is probably not the best topic for this paper. So um, if you're not sure that you're going to be able to defend your ultimate position and thesis, then that means you're on the trail of something that's worth working on. And I want that to happen for this paper. Okay, so be in contact with me. Um, if anyone who's in chat tonight wants to talk more, um, I'm actually feeling like I got a little bit more gas in the tank to talk about some philosophy tonight if you want to. I'm feeling okay. So um, send me a text, let me know, and we can do that. And for everyone on YouTube, hopefully I'll talk, I'll talk to you soon and see you next week. Sorry about that.